file manager application provides many powerful file management tools to view, organize, and maintain each of the file storage areas on our computer. Each of these storage areas, whether it be a diskette, optical, or hard drive, are maintained and organized in a similar way. These computer storage areas are organized like a filing cabinet, using file folders to segregate paperwork into logical categories, such as accounting and advertising. A computer organizes its program and document files using directories. This directory folder concept allows us to categorize our computer files. For example, we may have a directory containing documents whose files we want to sort into subgroups, such as letters, memos, and reports. Directories are also used to organize our applications like Windows and its associated programs. Now that we have a conceptual understanding of file management, let's look at File Manager and how it works. When we start File Manager for the first time, a document window called a directory window is displayed. A directory window is used to view files and directories contained on a storage device. The directory window is divided into three areas. The first area contains a selection of drive icons, each representing a computer storage device. Each drive icon may be different in appearance, depending upon the type of device it represents. For example, drive icon A appears as a floppy drive installed on our system. And drive icons C, D, and E appear as hard drive storage areas. The highlighted drive icon and its corresponding letter to the right indicates the storage area that is currently selected and displayed. Each drive is accessed by clicking on it with the mouse. The second area of the directory window provides us with a graphical representation of the current drive's directory list in the form of a directory tree. We use a directory tree to view and access our directories. This directory tree structure is similar to the trunk of a tree and its branches. The directory structure begins at the base, called the root directory. Each of the directories or branches that are created on a drive originate from this root directory. We start at the trunk and work outward to the connected branches each directory containing application or document files. Each directory has an associated directory icon to the left that looks like a folder. The current or selected directory is highlighted and is also distinguished by its opened folder icon. Each of these directories can have additional subdirectories beneath them. By selecting the Indicate Expandable Branches command from File Manager's tree menu, we can have the tree display which directories contain subdirectories. Directories having subdirectory branches have a plus sign on the directory's folder. Subdirectories are displayed by double-clicking on the directory branch. Note that when a branch is expanded, the plus sign is replaced with a minus sign indicating that the subdirectory branch is displayed. An expanded directory branch can be collapsed by double-clicking on the indicated directory. The third area of our directory window, the directory contents list, is where files for the currently selected directory are displayed. Note that each time we click on a new directory on the directory tree, the directory contents list is changed to reflect the contents of the selected directory. 
Each file name in the contents list has a corresponding icon to the left to help identify the type of file we are viewing. Files identified with a folder icon are directory files and represent the subdirectories under the currently displayed directory path. These subdirectory files are listed first in the contents listing and are identical in appearance and function to the directory icons displayed on the directory tree. Double clicking on a directory icon in the contents list is another means of accessing our subdirectories. Note how the directory tree reflects the selected subdirectory. When we are located in a directory below the root, an up arrow icon is displayed in the contents list. This arrow indicates that we have directories above the current directory's contents listing. Double-clicking this arrow accesses the directory above the current directory. Using this arrow, we can move up through the directory tree until we reach the top of our structure, the root. Let's access the Windows directory to discuss other file icon types. The contents list may consist of program, document, system, and other files. Each type of file is represented by a unique icon. The program files used to start our applications are indicated by an icon resembling an application window. Document files are represented by icons that resemble a written document sheet. System and hidden files that cannot be viewed under DOS have icons that look like a document and are differentiated by an exclamation point character. All other files are represented as blank document sheets. Using these icon designations, we can quickly determine the types of files we are viewing. Let's familiarize ourselves with the file selection process. Selecting an individual file from a contents list is accomplished by a simple mouse point and click. The process of selecting more than one file, referred to as extending a file selection, requires additional action. To do this, we need to select an initial file. Once the first file is selected, pressing and holding down on the control key allows us to select additional files. If we accidentally select a file, reselecting the unwanted file removes it from our selection list. If we release the control key and select a new file, our extended list is lost. In some instances, the files we want to select may be in sequence or adjacent to one another. Like before, we select an initial file. This file needs to be the first or last file in our selection of sequenced files. Once the first file is selected, pressing and holding down on the Shift key, and then selecting the file at the other end of our adjacent group, we can quickly extend our selection for the entire group of adjacent files. Once our extended file list has been selected, the keyboard's control key or shift key should be released before proceeding with a file operation, such as moving, copying, or deleting selected files. Now that we have a basic understanding of how a directory window functions, let's apply our knowledge using File Manager's menu commands. We'll go to the window menu first because it contains commands that allow us to open and arrange multiple directory windows. Selecting the new window command opens a second directory window, allowing us to select and view different file areas concurrently. Each window's title bar displays its currently selected directory. Double-clicking on a drive icon is another way of opening new directory windows. 
For example, clicking on Drive D. When we have several directory windows open, we can use the cascade or tile command under the window menu to organize open windows. Maximizing File Manager is also helpful, utilizing space for the tasks we are performing. File Manager's file menu contains commands that allow us to perform file functions to files and directories. The open command is used to start an application or a related document file. To open a file, we locate and select a program or document file that we want to start. For example, calendar.exe. Then select the open command to execute it. Starting an application using the open command is the same as double clicking on a program item icon in Program Manager. We can also open an application or document file directly by double clicking on it. Let's demonstrate by opening a bitmap art file, logo.bmp. The icon to the left of the file indicates a document associated with an application. Double clicking on a document file starts the associated application with the art file we selected. The move command allows us to move files and directories to other directory locations. For example, we will use two directories, both located on drive D. The first directory, named source, contains sample files that we want to move. The second directory, named target, will be used as our destination directory. Note that the target directory contains a directory beneath it, named DIR1. By viewing both the source and target directories, we are able to visualize the file management tasks we are performing. To move a file or files to a new directory location, we select from the source directory contents list the files to be moved. Let's move sample files one through three to the target directory. Selecting the move command prompts us with a move dialog box displaying a listing of the files we have selected. To move the files to the target directory, we enter the destination path, D colon backslash target in the to text box and click OK to confirm our request. Note that the files we selected and moved now reside in the target directory. We can also move files or directories using our mouse. After selecting sample files four through six, we can drag the files with the mouse to a destination directory. Note that as we drag the files, the icons to the left of the selected files disappear indicating that they are being moved. Once the files in the target directory are dropped, a dialog box appears asking us to confirm our request. Confirmation boxes are helpful in avoiding errors when performing file operations, especially when we are first learning File Manager. Selecting Yes completes the move operation. The selected files now reside in the target directory. File Manager allows us to drag and drop files on one of several locations within a File Manager directory window. We can drag and drop files on a directory icon in a directory tree, drag and drop on a subdirectory icon within a contents list, drag and drop files on the up arrow, transferring files to the directory just above the current directory listing or drag and drop on a drive icon to transfer files to the current directory of that drive. Note that when we are moving files to a different drive, 
that a plus sign is added to the file icon indicating a copy operation. When moving files to a different drive, we must select the shift key before dropping our files to move them. Otherwise, file manager assumes that we are performing a copy operation. We also have the option of dragging files to a directory window that has been minimized. Let's minimize target. A minimized directory window indicates the current directory listing by the label below its icon. In this case, D colon backslash target. Note that when we move the remaining files located in the source directory to the minimized target directory icon, that the cursor changes to a no sign when positioned over an area where the files cannot be placed. Dropping the files on the icon and selecting yes transfers our files. Restoring the target directory window confirms what we have done. File Manager also allows us to move directories. Let's select directory icon DIR1 under the target directory and execute the move command. Entering a destination path for the DIR1 directory moves it to the specified directory. Selecting OK confirms our request. The DIR1 directory, including its files and subdirectories, is now located beneath the source directory. Directories can also be moved using the mouse. To move directory DIR1 back to the target directory, we select it from the contents list or the directory tree. Then drag and drop it on the destination directory target. Again, we are prompted with a dialog to confirm our request. Using a similar approach to file manager's move operations, we can copy files and directories using the copy command. Selecting the files we want to copy and executing the copy command prompts us with a copy dialog box displaying a file listing of the selected files. Like the move command, we are able to enter a destination path in the to text box for the files we are copying. Clicking OK to confirm our request or cancel to end the operation. We can also copy files using the mouse. After selecting the files we want to copy and dragging them to the destination directory, we press and hold down the control key before dropping the selected files on the destination directory. Note that the file icons for the selected files disappear when releasing the control key, indicating a move operation. Reselecting the control key adds a plus sign to the file cursor icon and redisplays the file icons next to the selected files, indicating that we are performing a copy operation. Dropping the selected files in the source directory prompts us with a confirmation box asking us to confirm our request. The duplicated files now reside in the source directory. When we use either the move or copy commands to transfer files to a directory containing files with the same name, after confirming the operation, File Manager prompts us with a Confirm File Replace dialog box giving us the option to replace duplicate files in the destination directory. We are provided with the selections Yes, Yes to All, No, and Cancel, giving us the option to select Yes to replace each duplicate file individually, selecting No to skip files we don't want to replace, 
selecting cancel to end our request, or selecting yes to all to replace the remaining files without confirmation. Note that the files we decided not to move were excluded from the move process. The delete command is used to remove selected files or directories. Caution should be used when using this command. Unlike the commands we use under DOS, file manager's delete command has the power to remove files, directories, and subdirectories all in one step. Let's take a closer look at this powerful file function. After selecting the files we want to delete, using the delete command from the file menu prompts us with the delete dialog box displaying the selected files. We can select cancel to end the operation or OK to proceed. The confirm file delete dialog box appears displaying the first file to be deleted in our selection of files. Using this dialog box, we have the option to delete each file individually by selecting yes, with file manager asking for confirmation of each file, or no to skip files we have selected. Click cancel to end the request, or select yes to all to delete the remaining files without confirmation. Note that the files that we decided not to delete were excluded from the deletion process. File manager's delete command can also be used to delete directories. Deleting a directory removes the directory along with its files and subdirectories. Therefore, care should be taken before performing this operation. First, Select the directory to be deleted. Then, inspect the current directory's contents list for any files that are to be kept. Also, check subdirectory listings that may contain important files. After reviewing DIR1 and DIR2 for important files and reselecting the directory we are deleting, we are ready to remove these directories. Selecting the delete command prompts us with the delete dialog box displaying the path for the selected directory, giving us the option to end the operation by selecting cancel or OK to proceed with the operation. Selecting OK displays a confirm directory delete dialog box. Selecting yes steps us through each directory to be deleted or selecting yes to all prompts us with a confirm file delete dialog box. Again, selecting yes to all completes the request without further dialog confirmation. As we can see, subdirectories DIR1 and DIR2 no longer exist beneath the target directory. The rename command allows us to rename a file or directory. Selecting a file or directory from the contents list and using the rename command prompts us with the rename dialog box displaying the selected file or directory. Using the to text box, we type in the new name for the file and select OK to confirm the request. The selected file now reflects its new name. The Properties command is used to view information about a file. When selected, it provides us with information about the selected file, including its file size, modification date, directory path, and file attributes. File attributes are assigned to files or directories for a variety of reasons. Before attempting to use these attribute designations, we recommend that you review file attributes in your DOS manual to understand their use.
Let's close a directory window and access the Windows directory on drive C before we continue. The run command gives us a command line format for starting applications, allowing us to add parameters such as a document file name. For example, if we want to open a card file named address, we type in the program's file name, card file, followed by a space. Then type in the document file name, address.crd. Clicking OK opens the card file application along with a specified document. A mouse shortcut is available to accomplish this same task. To open the address card file, we drag and drop the file to the corresponding program file name. Dropping a file in this way prompts us to confirm our request to start the card file application using address.crd as the initial file. Clicking yes opens the application along with a selected file. File Manager's print command allows us to print a document file. We will cover this command in more detail in the Print Manager section. The Create Directory command allows us to create directories. To create a directory called Letters, we select the directory where we want our new directory placed. And use the create directory command to specify our directory name. Let's type in letters. Then select OK to confirm our request. The letters directory is created and appears as a subdirectory under the currently selected path. The search command allows us to find groups of files located in various directories on a drive. Using DOS wildcard characters, we can search for files having related file names or extensions. To locate files with an LTR extension, we can type in asterisk dot LTR in the search text box to indicate all files having an LTR extension. The start from text box is used to indicate the drive and directory level from which to begin our search. Let's start our search from the root directory of drive C. A search all subdirectories checkbox is also provided so that our search will include the directories under the indicated path. Selecting OK confirms our request. If File Manager finds files meeting our criteria, a search results window will be displayed listing the files found. We can select files from the search window to perform file management tasks, such as a move operation. Let's move these documents to the letters directory we created. Moving these files and confirming our request prompts us with a search results dialog box indicating that the contents of the current drive have changed. Selecting yes updates the search results window to show the new path of our files. The associate command allows us to identify a file name extension as belonging to a specific application. Most Windows applications have their own associated document extensions that are automatically added to the documents created. For example, Files having a WRI extension, such as letter.wri, are associated with the write application. Associated files 
are distinguished by their document icons to the left of the file and can be opened directly by double-clicking on them. We can add to the list of associated files using the associate command to assign new file extensions to an application. Let's demonstrate. The Microsoft Write files that we moved to our letters directory were given an LTR extension to differentiate these letters from our other Microsoft Write documents. Because these files have been given a non-assigned extension, they are not designated as document files. The associate command allows us to associate these files with the Microsoft Write application by typing in an LTR extension into the files with extension text box and then selecting the right application from the associate with list box. Clicking OK completes the operation. Notice that the file icons have changed from generic file icons to document file icons, indicating that they are associated. Now, whenever we execute a document file with an LTR extension, the right application will open with the associated document. The disk menu contains commands that are used for disk drive maintenance. The copy disk command allows us to duplicate floppy diskettes. The label disk command allows us to change the label or volume name for the selected disk drive. The format command formats or prepares a floppy diskette for data storage. The make system disk command copies DOS system files to a formatted diskette. The select drive command allows us to change the drive selection for the active directory window and is equivalent to accessing our drives using the drive icons. The tree menu contains commands that provide menu alternatives for controlling a directory window's tree display. We use these commands to collapse or expand selected directory branches. The view menu contains commands that allow us to customize the displayed file information for each directory window. The first three commands are a three-way display toggle. File manager defaults to tree and directory tree only, and directory only allow us to view each area exclusively. A directory window's tree and contents list is separated by a split bar that divides these areas. By clicking and dragging the bar with our mouse, we can reallocate the space used between these areas. The split command is a keyboard alternative to this mouse operation. Name, all file details, and partial details are file information display options each allowing us to view different levels of information. Each directory window's contents list, by default, displays only file name information. Selecting the All File Details command displays detailed information about each file, including file size, modification date and time, and file attributes. Selecting the Partial Details command provides information checkboxes, allowing us to specify which details we want to view. Selecting Name returns us back to our initial file listing format. The next set of commands under the View menu 
allows us to specify a sorting order for our files. By name, alphabetically, this is also the default order. By file extension, by file size, sorting from largest to smallest, or by modification date, with the most current files listed first. In addition to informational display options and sorting order, we are able to specify or limit the types of files that are displayed using the by file type command option. With this command, we can specify a particular file name or an extension using wildcard characters such as asterisk.doc to display only those files with a DOC extension, or entering asterisk dot asterisk to display all files in a directory listing. If you are not familiar with wildcard characters, refer to your DOS manual. File type checkboxes are also available to hide or reveal directories, program files, documents, or other non-program and non-document files for the selected directory window. Files having system or hidden file attributes that are not normally displayed can also be revealed by selecting the Show Hidden and System Files checkbox. The Options menu contains preference commands to customize File Manager. The confirmation command is used to enable or disable the display of confirmation messages when we delete a file or directory, replace a file, move or copy files using the mouse, or when we are performing a disk command operation such as formatting or copying a disk. The font option allows us to select the typeface, font style, and size for displaying our files and directories. For example, changing the font's point size from 8 to 14 increases File Manager's tree and file display listings. The status bar option, when checked, displays a status bar at the bottom of the file manager window. To the left, the status bar provides information about the currently selected drive, including the amount of available disk space and its total storage capacity. The right side displays information for the current directory, providing a directory file count and the amount of total space they occupy. Note that when files are selected from the contents list, the left side changes to reflect the number of files selected and their combined file size. The minimize on use command when selected directs the file manager to automatically minimize itself when a program or an associated document is opened from file manager. The Save Settings on Exit command preserves the current positions and views of open directory windows when we close File Manager. This concludes the File Manager section. As we've seen, File Manager provides an intuitive and graphical way to manage files and directories. The Print Manager application is used to install and configure each of our printers and to control the printing of Windows documents. Before documents can be printed, we need to tell Windows the type of printer we have and how it is connected to our computer. This is initially accomplished using printer setup when we first install Windows on our computer. Using the Print Manager application, 
we can easily re-access printer setup to add, modify, or remove a printer from our system. Once our printers are installed, we are able to print a document using an application's print command. Printing a Windows document transfers printer, font, and file information to Print Manager. Once an entire document has been transferred to Print Manager, the application is released from printing, allowing us to resume our work. Print Manager then works in the background, sending the document information to the selected printer, whether it be a laser, dot matrix, or pen plotter. Now that we understand the Print Manager concept, let's detail Print Manager's operation. We'll start Print Manager by double-clicking on its icon. In order to install or configure a printer, we use the Printer Setup command from Print Manager's Options menu. The printer's dialog box appears, providing the options needed to install and configure a printer. By selecting the Add Command button, we expand the printer's dialog box to display the list of printers that Windows supports. Using the scroll bar, we search through the list to locate and select the printer we want to install. If we have a printer that is not listed, we may still be able to use it with Windows. Many printers emulate or imitate the functions of other printers. By selecting a printer that our printer emulates, we provide Windows with the information it needs to operate. Refer to your printer manual for a printer emulation that is compatible with one of the printers in the list. Selecting a printer name and clicking the Install Command button prompts Print Manager to install a printer driver for the selected printer. A printer driver contains important information about a printer's features, including printing formats, supported fonts, and the connections it uses for communications with our computer. If we are installing a printer for the first time, Windows prompts us to insert the Windows installation disk containing the printer driver for the printer we have chosen. After inserting the appropriate diskette, clicking OK installs the selected driver for use with our printer. Using this procedure, we are able to select and install a driver for each of the printers we will be using under Windows. Once a printer driver is installed, we need to tell Windows how to use it. Installed printers are initially assigned to a port called LPT1. If our printer is connected to another port, we can change the port it is assigned to by selecting the printer's name from the Installed Printers list and clicking the Connect button to access the Connect dialog box. The Connect dialog box contains a list of printer connections, parallel or LPT ports, serial or COM ports, the EPT port used by IBM's personal page printer, and a file port used to direct the output of a document to a file for later printing at a remote location. The Connect dialog box also contains options to adjust the amount of time that Print Manager waits before notifying us about a printing problem. The default settings work in most situations and should only be changed if printing problems occur. The device not selected value is used to specify the amount of time in seconds that Windows waits before telling us that a printer is offline. The transmission retry value specifies the length of time that Windows waits before notifying us that a printer's memory buffer cannot accept any more information. Postscript printers should be given a larger transmission retry value because they take longer to process information, 
especially when graphics or a large number of fonts are used in a document. The fast printing direct to port checkbox, when selected, prints documents directly to the active printer bypassing DOS interrupts, thus increasing document printing speeds. If we are using printing software that uses DOS processes to control printing, this checkbox should be turned off. Note that when a COM port is selected, the settings button becomes available. The settings dialog box is used to specify the communication settings for the selected COM port. Refer to your printer manual to determine the correct communication settings for your serial printer. For now, let's select Cancel. Once a port assignment is chosen, clicking OK assigns it to the selected printer. After assigning an appropriate port for each printer, we use the Setup Command button to customize a printer's settings. Selecting the printer we want to set up and clicking on the Setup button displays the options available for that printer. The options displayed will vary depending upon the type of printer selected. If we have questions about any of the options displayed, clicking on the Help button or pressing the F1 key provides details about each printer option and how it is used. Closing Help removes it from our desktop. Selecting OK saves the current printer's option settings and returns us to the printer's dialog box. If we are no longer using a printer, we can remove it from the installed printer's list by selecting it and clicking the Remove button, clicking Yes to confirm our request. Note that even when a printer is removed from the installed printer's list, that the corresponding driver file is not deleted from our computer and can easily be placed back on the list by reinstalling it. Before concluding the printer setup process, we need to decide which of the installed printers will be used as our default printer. The printer chosen should be the one that is most often used. Let's select the Epson LQ850 printer. Clicking the Set as Default Printer button assigns it as our initial or default printer. Once each printer has been properly installed, we end the printer setup process by clicking the Close button to exit the printer's dialog box. Note that the print manager's workspace now displays each installed printer and their assigned port connections. Now that the setup process is complete, let's temporarily close the print manager. To illustrate how print manager functions, let's start the write application and open a document for printing. The way we print a document depends on the application we are using. Most Windows applications include a print command under an application's file menu. Selecting this command prompts us with a print dialog box. Note that the right application assumes that we are printing to the Epson LQ850, our selected default printer. If we decide to print to a different printer, or if we need to change a printer's current configuration, selecting the Setup button provides us with these types of options. Let's select Cancel to close Print Setup, and then click OK to begin printing our document. Note that as a Windows document is printing, Print Manager automatically starts and is displayed as an icon on our desktop. Opening Print Manager displays the print queue, capturing the document being printed. A print queue 
lists the print jobs for a specific printer, providing status information for each document, including the application a document was printed from, the name of the document file, the document's file size, and printing status. We can temporarily interrupt printing on a print queue by selecting the printer and clicking the pause button. Pausing a print queue suspends the printing of all documents in the queue. We pause a print queue in this way to change paper in a printer, address printer problems, or to reorganize the printing order of our print jobs. Let's minimize Print Manager and print a few more documents to illustrate how print jobs are displayed and the procedure used to change the printing order of our documents. For this example, we will use File Manager to print our documents. File Manager provides a useful alternative for sending documents to Print Manager quickly. We print a document from File Manager by selecting, dragging, and dropping an associated document on Print Manager's window or icon. Dropping a document on Print Manager opens the document's associated application and automatically starts the printing process, allowing us to confirm our request with an OK. Let's print a few more documents using File Manager. Note that only one document can be dropped on Print Manager at a time. Restoring Print Manager provides us with visual confirmation for each of the documents being printed, displaying the printing order for each print job in the queue. To change the printing order of a print job, we select and drag it to a new position in the queue. Note that the first print job in the queue has a printer icon to its left, indicating that it is currently printing and therefore cannot be moved. If we decide to end the printing of the current document or want to remove other print jobs in the queue, we can do so by selecting the print job and clicking the delete button. Clicking OK confirms our request. Note that the print queue's status is still paused. Reselecting the current printer and clicking the resume button restores the printing process for all remaining print jobs in the queue. Note that the status of the selected queue changes, indicating that printing has resumed. Let's pause the current queue again to discuss Print Manager's menu commands. The View menu contains a toggle command called Time Date Sent, specifying whether or not a print queue displays time and date information for each print job. The Print File Size Toggle command specifies whether or not a print queue displays file size information for each print job. The Refresh select net queue and other net queue commands pertain to network printing. Since we are not connected to a network, these items are dimmed. For those of us who will be using Windows on a network, let's briefly define each of these commands. The refresh command immediately updates the list of print jobs for the network printer we are using. The selected net queue command displays the print jobs for the current network queue. The other net queue command displays print jobs for other print queues available on the network. The first three commands under the options menu provide a three-way toggle, allowing us to specify the level of priority given to our print jobs. Selecting low priority causes most of our computer's processor time to be used for the other running applications with only a small amount dedicated to printing. The medium priority option causes the computer's processor time to be shared equally between Print Manager and the other applications we are using. The high priority option assigns the highest priority to printing. Note that by choosing this option, 
our other applications may slow down to accommodate this faster printing priority. The second set of commands under the options menu also provide a three-way toggle. Alert always, when selected, tells print manager to always display messages when a situation requires our attention while printing, even if it is not the active application. Flash, if inactive, when selected, causes the print manager icon or its title bar to flash until we restore its icon or activate its window. Once selected, print manager displays the message. Selecting ignore if inactive ignores these types of messages if print manager is inactive or running as an icon. The network settings command allows us to specify how print manager interacts with network queues and network routing. The network connections command is used to set up and connect to network printers. It should be noted that when printing a Windows document, Print Manager is initially displayed as an icon. Once a document is printed, Print Manager's icon automatically closes, indicating that the printing process is completed. If we close Print Manager before it has finished printing, a message appears indicating that all pending jobs in Print Manager's queue will be canceled. Now that you are familiar with Print Manager, you can see how Windows printing provides multitasking capabilities, allowing us to be much more productive. The Control Panel application provides us with many tools to configure and customize the Windows operating system to meet our individual preferences and requirements. Let's open Control Panel from the Program Manager. We are presented with a window containing icons. Each icon represents an option that is used to configure and customize windows. The icons displayed in Control Panel may differ depending upon the type of computer and hardware peripherals we are using and whether or not we are connected to a network. Control panel icons cannot be moved, but do rearrange themselves when the control panel window is sized. The control panel window also contains a status bar that describes the function of the icon that is selected. We access a control panel option by double-clicking on its icon. Let's discuss each option, beginning with the color icon. The color option is used to change the color designation for each Windows element. The color dialog box initially displays a sample desktop screen to symbolize the color choices we make. Color selections can easily be changed using one of the predefined color schemes listed in their drop-down list box. As a shortcut, we can use the keyboard's up and down arrow keys to preview each of these predefined schemes. Selecting OK at this point redefines our desktop using the color scheme we selected. The color option also gives us the ability to define our own set of colors using the color palette button to expand the color dialog box. We assign a color to an element in one of two ways. Using the screen element drop down list box, we are able to select the element we want to change. Selecting the menu bar element and choosing a new color from the color palette changes it to the newly selected color. In this case, yellow. Or using the sample screen, we can access each element directly by selecting the element we want to change with the mouse, like the application workspace, and choosing a new color. If the current selection of colors does not contain the color we want, selecting the Define Custom Colors button to access the custom color selector allows us to create and add 
our own custom colors. After our color assignments have been made, these color preferences can be saved as a color scheme using the Save Scheme button to name our new color combination. Let's name our changes My Colors. Clicking OK adds the new scheme to the list. Now that we have assigned our color combination a name, let's reselect the initial color scheme and close the color dialog box to continue our discussion. Using the Fonts option, we can view, add, or remove fonts for use with our Windows applications. Windows installs three types of fonts, each designed for a specific use. Screen fonts are used to display screen information in predetermined point sizes, like the text that appears in a dialog box. Plotter fonts which are scalable to any point size, are used for screen information and plotting graphics on pen plotters. True type fonts, which are new to Windows 3.1, can be used with most types of printers. These fonts are scalable to any point size and look exactly the same on the screen as they do when printed, giving us what you see is what you get functionality. Occasionally, we may need to remove fonts. Highlighting a font from the installed font list and selecting the Remove button prompts us with the Remove Font dialog box. Using the optional checkbox allows us to delete the font from our disk. Selecting Yes simply removes the font from the installed list. Selecting the Add button presents us with a dialog box that is used to add fonts to our installed fonts list. To reinstall the font we just removed, we double click to select the directory where a font is located. The fonts that are included with the Windows operating system reside in the Windows system directory. Selecting the font we just removed and clicking OK reinstalls the selected font on our system. If you have a limited amount of random access memory, accessing the True Type Options dialog box allows you to disable True Type functionality to provide additional memory. For more information about fonts and their use, refer to chapters 5 and 6 of the Windows User's Guide. The Ports option is used to specify the communication settings for each of the serial ports in our computer system. Serial ports are used to connect a variety of peripheral devices to our computer, including modems, pointing devices, and serial printers. The Ports Settings button is used to specify communication parameters for the currently selected port. For more information, use the Help button or refer to Chapter 5 of the Windows User's Guide. The Mouse option controls the way our pointing device works with Windows, allowing us to adjust a pointer's settings. The options available to us will differ depending upon the pointing device we are using. The Desktop option provides a dialog box allowing us to enhance the appearance and function of our desktop. These options include Pattern, Desktop Background Selections, Applications, a checkbox for turning on or off the message box when we are fast task switching, Screen Saver for monitor screen protection and security, Wallpaper, an art option for covering our desktop. Sizing grid, an option to change snap to grid increments and border width. Icons, spacing and label display options. And finally, the cursor blink rate 
changing the speed of the insertion cursor's blinking. Let's select a bitmap file from the wallpaper drop-down list to show how easy it is to customize the desktop. Selecting the Arches bitmap in conjunction with the Tile option and confirming these changes with an OK covers our desktop with the Arches art file. To continue our discussion, let's remove the Arches wallpaper by selecting None. The keyboard option is used to customize keyboard speed parameters. Keyboard delay adjusts the time it takes for a key to start repeating itself when held down. The repeat rate adjusts the speed at which the key repeats itself. Test allows us to sample our adjustments. The printer's option is identical in function to the printer setup option in Print Manager, with one exception. Control Panel's Printer's dialog box contains a checkbox option, allowing us to disable Print Manager. This allows us to print documents directly to a printer. The International option is used to customize windows for use with international applications. The date and time option is used to change the date and time of your computer's system clock. It is important that our system date and time are correct because all files are time and date stamped. The 386 enhanced option is available only when Windows is running in the enhanced mode. Computers having a 386 or higher processor and two or more megabytes of RAM can run in this mode. The 386 enhanced option allows us to control Windows multitasking operations of applications and devices. Device contention controls the priority that Windows sets for non-Windows and Windows programs that are competing for the same communications port. Scheduling allows for the adjustment of time slicing. Time slicing is the amount of computer processing time allocated to all Windows applications versus non-Windows applications. These values are only relevant when we are running non-Windows applications under Windows. The values we specify work in conjunction with the PIF settings of a non-Windows application. For information on PIFs, Program Information Files, refer to Chapter 8 in the Windows User's Guide. Selecting the Virtual Memory Command button displays the current settings of the Windows Swap File. The Windows Swap File is an area on a hard disk that Windows uses to store information exchanged from RAM. Virtual memory allows us to run more programs than our computer's memory would normally permit. By selecting the Changes button, our dialog box expands, allowing us to change our virtual memory settings. Usually, the default values that Windows suggests are a good choice. For now, Let's select each of the Cancel buttons and continue our discussion on Control Panel Options. The Drivers option is used to install, remove, and configure drivers for additional devices that are added to our computer. Drivers included in this category will most often pertain to multimedia devices, such as a MIDI device or laser disc player, and may also include other devices for pen computing. The sound option is used to assign different sounds to Windows Systems events, such as Critical Stop and Windows Exit. We can only assign sounds if a sound card and associated driver are installed in our computer. We've now finished the control panel section, giving us a better understanding on how to customize windows.
In this section, we will discover how Windows integrates our work to dynamically share information between applications. Windows provides a temporary area in memory called the clipboard that we use to place and retrieve data. We share this data by transferring it to and from the clipboard, whether it be text, numerical data, or artwork. Windows applications normally use the edit menu to communicate with the clipboard. The cut and copy commands are used to transfer selected data to the clipboard. The paste command transfers information from the clipboard to the application. Windows 3.1 adds a new extension to the cut and paste concept called Olay, Object Linking and Embedding. Applications that address this new feature will have additional edit menu commands. For information about Olay, refer to Chapter 13 in the Windows User's Guide. Now that we understand the clipboard concept, Let's step through a few practical examples of how to share information using cut and paste. First, we'll start the clipboard viewer and card file application. To better utilize the desktop, we'll minimize program manager and double click on the desktop to bring up the task list to tile the two applications. Now, let's open a card file document called address.crd, clicking OK to confirm our request. We have written a letter to a construction firm called Builders Unlimited and want to retrieve their address for our letter salutation. Clicking on the desired card brings it to the front for our use. To transfer data to the clipboard, we first select or highlight the information that is to be copied or moved by clicking and dragging the mouse across the area of text that we want to select. Releasing the mouse button sets our selection. Using the application's cut command permanently removes the selected text from the application to the clipboard. Once information is transferred, it is available for placement in the current document or in other documents or applications. Selecting an application's paste command transfers clipboard information into the current application at its point of insertion. The clipboard, like any other application, uses memory. If memory is low, after transferring clipboard information, we may want to free memory by clearing its contents. We clear the clipboard using the clipboard viewer's delete command. Note that when we clear the clipboard, its contents are permanently lost. Selecting information and using the application's copy command allows us to duplicate selected information to the clipboard. Information that is cut or copied from an application is automatically transferred to the clipboard even when the clipboard viewer is not open. Opening the clipboard viewer simply allows us to verify its contents. Now that the clipboard contains our address, let's close both card file and the clipboard viewer and open the program manager. Let's open the right application using the project documents icon we created in the program manager section. Double clicking on the project documents icon starts the right application. Using the file menu's open command, we are able to select our letter to place the address. To transfer the address from the clipboard to the letter, we use the application's I-beam to select an insertion point. 
Then use the edit menu's paste command to place the clipboard information into our letter. Now that the address has been placed, let's enhance our letter with the company logo that was created in Paintbrush. We'll minimize right and the project group window to access the Paintbrush application. Using the application's open command, we access the open dialog box to choose our company's art file and click OK to confirm our request. Like the address, we need to select and copy the logo to transfer it to the clipboard. Applications like Paintbrush may use different methods of selecting information. Paintbrush uses cutout tools for selecting artwork. Using Paintbrush's rectangular cutout tool and moving our cursor into the drawing area, we click and drag the mouse to enclose the area that we want to define. Releasing the mouse button selects the cutout. Selecting the copy command copies the cutout to the clipboard. Let's close Paintbrush and open the clipboard to verify what we have done. The clipboard can only hold one piece of information at a time. So when new information is transferred to the clipboard, previous information is lost. Now that the logo is on the clipboard, it can be placed in our document. Selecting an insertion point at the head of the letter and selecting the paste command places the logo into the document, completing our letter. The objective of this section has been to familiarize you with Windows integration basics. We suggest that you review and practice these concepts before pursuing Windows advanced integration features.